Hello and welcome to our time. Where were you last time? Oh, how come I was away on a holiday? You were. Oh. Sue was very generous and filled in for you, but I missed you, Janice. Oh, Malcolm. She was on the other side of the world, what can we say? And today, speaking of the other side of the world, mm -hmm. if, would, have you ever considered being the Air Force cadets? No, but I have a nephew that is. Oh, was. really? He's actually moved up quite a way. And how much do you know about people in public office, like, for example, a mayor? Well, we're going to find out about more about mayoral duties and a man who's virtually given his life to the people of the city yes, and the state. Back. Yes, but, but right now... Over to Ken. Thank you, team. Well, we're going to talk now with Graham Evans. Graham is a, a former officer with the Australian Air Force Cadets. Why are we talking to Graham? Well, obviously, to find out a little bit about the Air Force Cadets and also to talk about their 75th anniversary. Welcome, uh, Graham. Thank you, Ken. The Air Force Cadets, you've been telling me uh, you were a young Air Force Cadet lad and then you were, no, came back as a senior Air Force Cadet lad. Yes, well I joined the Air Training Corps as it was uh, in 1957 and uh, had two years there and then uh, retired away and uh, came back in 1988 as, uh, as an officer and an adult. An officer and a gentleman, or am I drawing a long bow there? Well, I'm just saying an, an adult. <laughs> okay. uh, what is it? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, the Air Training Corps, or known as the ATC in those days, uh, was formed back in 1941, and that was due to... During war the war. Years, during the war mm. years. And the idea was to give 16 and 18-year-olds the opportunity to understand about aviation and its background, and then to hopefully go on and enlist in the RAAF. And it, it, it's helping them? It, or, well, I'm saying helping them. It did help. It, uh... Well, it was terrific in actual fact. Uh, when you look through the figures of, from 1941 through to 1945, over 12,000 cadets uh, went through and, con and enrolled, enlisted in the Air Force case, in the Air Force. Yeah, and, and, and at war's end after 45, what happened then? Well, it became more peacekeeping. So from 45, 46 through to 49, it became more of a peacekeeping type environment uh, where they dropped the age, of the, the starting age, through to the age of 14, which brought in school children in high school years. Yes, yes. And so that was, and that, that enabled cadets, back to when I joined the Air Training Corps, uh, to get an interest in aviation and also have a background in the military side of it. So what do they actually do? Well... Oh, and has it changed much since the 40s? Well, it certainly has. It certainly has. The age group has gone down to the year in which you, be, you turn 13 and it goes through, you can stay in until you finish at 20. So it can go through right through your high school years and then uh, after that, uh, even going into university, a lot of the cadets get into senior ranks in university times and then by the time they're 18, they, they actually leave the Air Training Corps, as it is now called the Air Force, Australian Air Force Cadets, and then go on and uh, maybe join the Army Reserve, the Air Force Reserve, wherever, and they still come back as secondary duties and become instructors in the Australian Air Force Cadets. How far can they go with their training? A cadet? Yeah. A cadet can go, from a rank point of view, can go to cadet under officer. Right. Generally, that would mean that they've done at least four years, four years of training, which includes home training work, which is done during school terms yeah. uh, on one night a week for three hours, one night a week. And then on, in the holidays, uh, particularly in, um, in the Christmas holidays, they would go for a junior NCO course where they'd be qualified to uh, be a corporal, cadet corporal. Uh, they could then go on after another 12 months of training back in their home squadrons to become a cadet sergeant, go up to a cadet flight sergeant, then go back in another 12 months time and do quite an expansive time being a cadet warrant officer or a cadet under officer. So uh, the practical side, do they get to sit in aircraft and... Absolutely, they oh, can. That, that'd be fun. Uh, well, the enjoyment for cadets, uh, even after 12 months worth of training, can go to a general service training camp, yeah. uh, which could be conducted on any of the bases, and most of those bases are operational. 
So the opportunity of going flying in anything like at, at Edinburgh and at Orion, for instance, uh, to uh, any of the other type of aircraft where it could be a Hercules out of uh, RAF Richmond, yeah. uh, can get up to go and chance there, uh, you know, get a chance to go up in, in those aircraft. Uh, there was a time when uh, the RAF had the, uh, the helicopters, we had a chance to even do it with helicopters as well. So they can go flying there, but from that point of view, then if a person, if a cadet wishes to get a, uh, a glider or a powered flying qualification, then by 15 they can do a gliding courses over a period of weekends and uh, at camps and uh, be go, go solo before they get their driver's licence. And the same thing with powered flying. By 16 you can be going solo after 11 sessions, 11 hours of flying. Wow. Have you had any uh, remarkable success stories, Graham, from cadets going on to bigger and better things? Uh, absolutely. Over, if you take right around the wings, right around Australia, what we've got is that many of the cadets have finished up in very high positions throughout the RAAF, uh, right up to Chief of Air Force. Wow. And so uh, with the training that they started with, uh, the four or five years that they did with the Air Training Corps, then it's just gone on and on from the point of view that they've gone in either as officer levels and could have gone through training at Point Cook when it was operational or even through ADFA and uh, go through their programs, become pilots, become air crew, anywhere through any of the musterings through the Air Force mm. and uh, it stands them in good stead for, uh, you know, at one stage I think the indication was was that there was at least five of the high star general, uh, high star uh, air officers were ex-air training corps cadets. So it was in their blood from we kids no doubt. Absolutely, it's yeah. fantastic. Does it cost them anything? The, uh, the flying side of things, if, we, if we're looking at flying, uh, gliding, uh, you can go solo for $1,000. Uh, powered flying three and a half but there are flying scholarships that sit on that as well so that that figure can be reduced as well. That's a great saving isn't it if you were doing it uh, Yeah absolutely. Privately. Yeah. But as from the point of view of being a, a, a cadet just going through effectively there's no cost, uniforms are free, um, they're provided through the RAAF. Um, home training nights uh, generally most of the squadrons are on, uh, on military bases so there's no cost involved in that side of things. They're maintained that way. Um, the only, uh, there may be some costs involved if uh, there was any hireage of anything, but that doesn't, that doesn't come up very often. Sounds ideal, doesn't it, for an adventurous... I was going to say boy, but that's not right, is it? Because girls can also avail themselves, can't they? Yes, well, 1980 saw a change in the whole of the attitude of uh, the uh, Air Training Corps. Uh, in 1980, the, uh, the consideration was that there were girls knocking on the door that they wanted to join, and uh, there were some all-female squadrons around at that particular time, pressing the uh, the requirement that uh, or the, re the request that they could join. So the uh, defence and the RAAF then introduced female officers and staff to get them uh, involved in the organisation and then from there in 1982 females, girls of the same age were introduced into the Air, Air Training Corps. And they're doing well and they, enjoying it? They love it. Great. Uh, I do know that there was one particular girl uh, on a camp that I did uh, talk to at one stage and I asked her why uh, she had joined the Air Training Corps and her uh, reaction was to meet Tom Cruise. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think... And you would. introduced yourself as Tom. <laughs> I wish. Yeah, yeah. well, um, we'll leave that one alone. Yes. Um, how many people are involved Australia-wide? There's 7,500 cadets yep. and 1,000 uniformed and non-uniformed instructors. So, uh, and when I use the term non-uniformed, there's a number of people throughout each of the wings and throughout the squadrons uh -huh. uh, who don't wish to go into uniform but want to still be involved with uh, the training of the young people. And uh, so they go through a process not similar to uh, a uniformed instructor, 
but certainly they go through the same uh, the same early process of mm. uh, joining, and uh, they're they're a great support to the uniform instructors. Time has gone very quickly, but we had better talk about the 75th anniversary. What's happening there? The 75th anniversary, uh, each of the wings around Australia would be developing their own programs. Uh, we in South Australia, or Six Wing as it's known here, are um, having three major functions. There's a reunion of past staff, which I'm desperately trying to find. Um, at uh, prior to the, the graduation parade at RAF Edinburgh on the, uh, the 16th of January. There'll be a uh, exercise of the uh, entry to the City of Adelaide, March, in, in June, and a commemorative ball in, uh, in November. November. Mm. Um, I, I, we'll be able to uh, put people in touch with you. We, your details will be on the screen. Excellent. Which is good, and you're only too pleased to speak with people. Absolutely, I'd be delighted. Um, I, I put a little detail in the Sunday Mail recently, and I had an 87-year-old gentleman ring me up saying that he joined in 1942. Yeah and for about an hour and a half he told me all about his time in the Air Training Corps. It was just fabulous. Fantastic and it's been great talking with you too Graham. Graham Evans, former officer with the Air Training Corps and uh, intriguing stuff isn't it? Coming up very shortly Janice and Malcolm and we're talking with uh, the Honourable John Trader, the Mayor of West Torrens Council. Welcome back. Malcolm. Thank you. I didn't know I'd gone away. <laughs> didn't uh, it is our great pleasure to welcome His Worship the Mayor, the Honourable John Trainer OAE, who is the Mayor of the West Torrens City Council and who's been a Mayor for how long, John? 15 years. Originally I planned for 14, but it's going to stretch out to 18 if I live long enough. <laughs> yeah, but because, why did you stand again? Uh, I wasn't terribly impressed with the potential mayors that were circling around. I'm not looking for anyone who's a carbon copy of myself. I just wanted to be sure that uh, there'd be no one who'd be a bit of an embarrassment. But as a mayor, you put things in place and you hope that they'll be followed through after your tenure. Well, you hate to spend a lot of hard work on something. Like, I concentrated very hard on making sure that West Torrens had a good reputation. Um, because on, in the period up until about 2000, for a while there, it was a bit like the way Burnside was in recent years. And I feel that we've been very lucky. We haven't had many bad headlines over the last 14 years. No. And I wouldn't like to see them start coming again. No. For those interstate, um, Burnside Council had um, uh, all sorts of issues, including government investigations mm. and a whole lot of problem. And the, the, the area that John represents hasn't. Um, but can we go back to the beginning of, you, of your life? You have led a very interesting life, John. Um, you started out as a teacher. I did. For how Four, many years? 14 years as a teacher, four at one high school, six at another, which turned out to be in the district of West Torrens, and I could talk about that a little bit later. And then I spent 14 years in the State Parliament, and now 15 years as Mayor. Loved every minute of it. It's a very full life you've had. Yeah, well, got, busy, busy, busy. Well, I got an Order of Australia recently and I felt it was a bit strange. It's like getting an award for enjoying yourself because <laughs> there hasn't been a day when I've got up and thought, oh, I've got to go to work. I oh, look, probably a couple of exceptions if I was ill, mm. you know, and I think, oh, gosh, I've got to face those classes. But I enjoyed every day teaching. I enjoyed every day in the Parliament. I've enjoyed every day being Mayor. But what made, you, what made you go into public service? Uh, I went to a private school on a scholarship. I'm not uh, fanatically religious or anything like that, but I was very impressed with the New Testament saying, and it's different according to which particular Bible you read, but the Catholic one read, from those to whom much has been given, much is expected. In other words, if the community's been good to you, the world's been good to you, you owe something back. Mm. And the other was John Kennedy at around the same time with his inaugural address, because I'm, I'm 72 now, so I can remember these things as if they were yesterday. They're not the only ask, one, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And those two things, I thought, they make good sense. If we're not here to help each other, what are we here for? Mm. Well, that's true. And was that your main motive? Yeah, yeah, I just enjoyed so helping what people. what was the process from school teacher to politician? 
Oh, well, I was one of those who was involved in the Vietnam protest, and, uh, and also I was driving taxis part-time, and that took me out of my comfortable middle-class environment out there, really among the workers, to see life at the, at the pointy end and to realise that not everybody had the good luck that I did, which probably reinforced the attitude that I had from yeah. before. And the Labor Party at that time seemed the natural vehicle. I'm not quite, don't feel quite the same way about it today, I've got to say. You're not a member anymore? No, no, I resigned in uh, disgust or was expelled, whichever you like to look at it, <laughs> in 1996. Oh, well, no, I see, if you stand as an independent, you're automatically expelled. Yes. So whether you count my facts saying I resign or the deed constituting yes. my expulsion is a moot point. Is that a difficult thing, though? Because I suppose it's the same with people on television. Do you keep watching somebody because you like them? Mm. Or do you just turn off because there's that those those people again? We don't watch them. Oh no, I'm still, I like still follow everything. Do yep. you? Yeah, I know. I follow the media intensely. I've got uh, More to a the couple point. of video recorders, you know, DVD recorders, mm. and I record every current affairs or news program, and I skim through them before I go to bed. Okay, to see how the world's doing. Yeah, and and, and look for anything, you know, just visually. You'll see, oh, that's something that may concern my council. So you stop, go back, and, and yep. watch that particular bit. But but at the same time, you have to be voted in, and you're obviously voted out at some point. How do you feel when, when they didn't vote for you, even if it was only 1%? Oh, it's, oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's like a bereavement. It's like a death in the family. And, I mean, because it's not like you've just missed out because of your performance, because often it doesn't reflect on your performance at all. It can be the People party. don't like you because of what your leader's done. Yeah. But I always consoled myself and I was unsuccessful. I wouldn't be the first person in the world who's lost a job because their boss was incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it happens to thousands every week in Australia at the moment, <laughs> Everywhere, whether it's General Motors Holden or, or mm. anywhere else. And how much, how much uh, as an individual politician, can you influence the party? Or is it so much not just now. the party line? No, not now. No, it's, uh, it's very much... The, the pyramid is very much all concentrated on the point rather than the grassroots. Uh, Do you think that's what's and, gone wrong with politics? Oh, that's one of the things, yeah. And, and the media have made it worse because they concentrate entirely on leaders. They run it yes. almost like it's mm. a presidential election, mm. whether yeah, it's state true. or federal. And you sort of feel that they might as well not even bother with having members of parliament at all, but just in the state parliament they could just have, uh, you know few dozen cardboard cutouts and just move them from one side to the other in a division. So do you ever get to the point where it's like, oh, this is all too hard, I just can't be bothered anymore? Oh, no, no, no. No, no. no but I just concentrate on what I can do. Mm. I mean, I lost the 1993 election for two reasons. One was my district was redistributed. You work hard for 20,000 people, then you suddenly find 10,000 were taken away, put in someone else's district, oh. and you've got 10,000 who don't know you from a bar of soap. Yeah. And I had that combined with the state bank disaster with the Labor government at the time and people had to take it out on their nearest target in my district, of course, that was me. Oh. I probably could have coped, I've worked so hard, I think I could have coped with either one of those, but not the two at the same time, oh. the, the sort of perfect storm. Oh. And I picked myself up and thought, well, we'll have a go at winning the seat back again. Yeah. Then I got the message from the Labor Party, well, we don't really want you. You lost by only 1%, so we're going to win that anyway, whether you run as candidate or not. So we can pass it oh. round as a prize among the factional boys and girls. The second thing they said, that 50, you're too old. And this was a district which is one of the greyest in Australia. 50, you're too old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where people still called me young John. Very, yeah, very <laughs> questionable now, isn't you know? it? <laughs> and then the third one was, you've got a parliamentary pension, so you've got an obligation to just get out of the road so somebody else can get there and get one. And that infuriated me. But you're also a Speaker in the House. Yes, I was. That's where the title honourable came from. Yep. It's got nothing to do with being mayor. Or being uh, honourable. <laughs> well, I'd like to think it was, you know. <laughs> well, I always had a couple of, one lovely compliment paid to me by somebody from one of the electoral commissioners who said, John, I can't believe that you can be a human being in a, in a chamber full of reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> that right? It's very really interesting talking about politics, but you obviously found a calling still in public service, but in local public service. Well, yeah. Well, when they wouldn't let me win my seat back, I ran as an independent, did quite well, but still not quite well enough. And I decided that I'd run for mayor after some people approached me because there'd been a bit of embarrassment connected with the West Highlands Council. And I looked at what could I do for the rest of my life. Didn't want to play golf. 
I can't anyway. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to just watch TV. I wanted to do something useful. And I thought, well, the taxpayers of South Australia spent a lot of money in giving me a good political education. Um, here's something I can use it for, for the ratepayers of West Torrens. And I, uh, I won in a landslide. I no longer lived on the western side of the city. I'd moved because I had two daughters living in places where they wanted me to be nearby as a babysitter. Uh -huh. oh, but gee, with my wife's agreement, I mortgaged job, yeah. the house we were living in and bought a flat in the area that made me a, a property owner. Uh -huh. and therefore a rate pay in uh -huh. the area. I won in a landslide and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that for now, for four elections in a row, I've not had an opponent. I've been That's elected under. Well, you've done a good job. That's I know fantastic. that personally that you've done a good job. Yeah. It's, it's not that unusual for country mayors, for example, to be re-elected unopposed. And up until about 20 years ago, it would happen in the city. And there's always one or two each election, but no one has even had three in a row. One councillor had... Uh, two but they weren't in a row and I've had four in a row. That's fantastic. Congratulations yeah. for that. Well I suppose the good thing is it doesn't matter what age you are and, and just talking of being able to, to take from what you've achieved in life and then give something back as we did before. You've certainly done that. For people watching who are quite unsure as what their future is going to be, they may be forced into, you might be forced into retirement but it's not what you want. How can people become part of uh, local government? Well, you have to stand to be elected as one of the councillors. Um, in, in South Australia here, things are a little bit different for mayor. We're not elected from the councillors. No, in, in the eastern states, stand. not exclusively, the pattern varies a little bit from place to place, but in the eastern states, the councillors are elected and they pick one of themselves as the mayor. The problem with that, of course, is the mayor spends all his time sucking up to the councillors to keep the majority so he keeps uh -huh. his job, whereas I don't have to worry about no. that. I, all I, I have to do is keep the community happy. happy. And yes. I, I said to them in my first weeks, I said, if I have to cho uh, choose between pleasing you 14 councillors or doing what I think 50,000 people in the district, right. you're not in the race. Mm. And that's because you're out and about pe and you're very accessible to local people as well. Oh, very stubborn too when I'm convinced I'm right. But obviously after all this time too, you know what you're talking about, John. Oh, well, when, when, no. when they get the knives out, I say to them, put those <laughs> knives away. <laughs> I have been stabbed in the back by experts. There is nothing you can come up with I haven't been on the receiving end of already. But I do go out there and I do the hard yards. Mm. And I think that's important to have a sense of obligation. Yes. When you feel it's just, you know, you don't really want to get out and get out of bed and go somewhere early on a Sunday morning to get up and do it. When you'd rather be with your family at somebody's birthday but you party said or whatever reason, you go out yeah, at night. You did, sorry to interrupt me, but you did say you had seven obligations in one day. I mean, that's a lot of running around. Oh, yeah, there's that, a lot that's of That's exceptional. I mean, sometimes you, I might be lucky and I have a whole weekend to myself. Yeah. On mm. um, the other hand, time, but like this one I mentioned life. to you earlier on, I had seven official functions on the one day mm. on, a, on a Sunday. Mm. It happened to be my birthday too. Oh, did it? Oh, what a way to <laughs> So I managed to fit in a cake with my grandchildren. Oh, good. John, it's been great talking <laughs> yeah, with you and I just hope it's encouraged you to take up perhaps some position in public service in the future. John, good luck for the future and may you have many more years in this area. Lovely talking to you. Thank you for coming in and talking to us. Well, thank you to you too, lovely Ems. <laughs>person who is the mover and shaker in your community so yeah, yeah. check it out but if you're interested in knowing more about um, becoming a member of the public yeah. who can affect the way things happen in your community then check out your local council and find out how to begin how you can help mm. absolutely now we'd love you to join us by looking at our Facebook page or checking out the shows online but until next time on our time we'll see you next time keep yourself nice take care then. bye